Welcome to Mile High Reefers. I'm Scott Anderson and doing my first live stream with the new computer. So for today's video, I thought we'd talk about why corals are so expensive. So I'm waiting to see if people get on. So once you get on, if you just tell me if the audio is working, I'd really appreciate it since this is the first time using this setup. From what I see on my end, it looks pretty darn good, but um, hopefully you guys are seeing it really well. Looks like we got Abel in here. So hi, it's so good to see you. And Narl, hi, and we got sound. So we're doing fantastic. All right, so we're doing the live stream today. And first, that's one thing I wanna start doing is more live streams so I can connect more with you guys, the audience. So for today's topic, we're gonna to talk about why corals are so expensive. And the big reason corals are, well, there's a bunch of reasons, but we're gonna talk about two different streams of coral that come in. We've got the wild collected coral, and then we've got the aquacultured coral. They're very different. All right, hold up. We got audio is clear, but sound is a bit weird. I'll try moving the mic, see if that does anything. Hopefully we gain something. Like I said, new setup, but we'll try this and see how it goes. Um, okay, so let's start with the coral and then we'll get to all the comments and questions kind of as we go to the end. So let's start with the wild imported corals. So. Coral seems like it should be just about free. You just go out, grab it off the ocean, and bring it back, right? It's not quite that easy, right? I mean, these are real companies out there, and these are people who are trying to earn a living. You know, they got to buy the hot dogs for their family. They've got to make enough money to at least justify going out there and doing it every day. And I know a few coral collectors and most of the ones I know aren't getting rich off of this. So many of them are in it for the love of what they do. But if you think about it, <clears throat> to run a coral collection business, you're gonna need personnel. So you gotta have people working for you. You gotta have boats, you've gotta have insurance. I can't imagine what the insurance must be like for a business like that, where you're sending people out in something relatively dangerous where they've gotta dive and go out there. So all of this stuff has to happen, right? You have to have collection facilities. So when you go out, you collect all that coral, you gotta bring it back, you gotta have holding facilities, you gotta sort it, you gotta deal with CITES, you've got all of the airline stuff. So the collection process, while it sounds like the coral is free, the coral's actually fairly expensive, even for them, just to go collect. So the corals, they grow in the ocean, they're collected, and then they're brought back in. And they actually do this pretty efficiently. Given everything that happens, the cost of the coral that they sell it for is pretty reasonable. Now, the coral cost at the original origination can be reasonable, but the first thing that's gonna add a lot of cost on is shipping. When corals are shipped from the destination, whether it's Australia, Indonesia, Vietnam, and in the old days, Fiji, there's a big cost to that shipping. It's not uncommon for a company to spend more money on the shipping of the coral than they did on the corals themselves. And this is all because it has to be airmailed overnight. There's no other way to do it. This stuff's not going to last longer in the bag than about 48 hours. And honestly, 48 hours is going to be pushing it. So the coral has to be shipped by air freight to the destination. So for us in the U.S., most of it goes in through LAX. Not all of it. Some of it goes through it like Atlanta and a couple other places. But for the most part, LAX is where it's at. And then the companies that are in LA, they kind of have a they kind of have a little bit of a bonus because there's no other shipping. But for all of the companies outside of LA, then you have to ship the coral again. So there's another big shipping cost on top of that. So shipping is super expensive when it comes to collect when it comes to coral pricing. 
So then the coral has to go through to a wholesaler. So the wholesaler <clears throat> and wholesalers in general buy in volume and sell in volume. And really the volume is where they make their money. That's just how wholesale works in every business. The idea is to sell high volumes and try to keep the cost reasonably low and make enough money to keep the doors open. So the wholesaler has to get the coral and then that coral has to be sold on to a retailer. Now, if your retailer is close to the wholesaler, they can buy it directly and avoid more shipping costs. But if it's not, you got to ship, right? So if you're in New York and you're ordering from that LA wholesaler, you've got to pay for that shipping cost to go from LA to New York. This is just how it has to work. And again, it's another round of overnight shipping and it's pretty darn expensive. Now, when you're shipping from the wholesaler side to LA, there's a couple there or from, yeah, from like LA to New York, we'll keep with that example. There's a couple ways the shipping has to work. You can either ship it directly through the airline, which is usually a little cheaper, but usually when companies want to do that, they're dealing with higher volumes and it's not as convenient because you have to pick it up at the airport, which for some people is a big deal. Not all of us live close to an airport. So if you have to ship there, you can get a little bonus going through the airport. Otherwise, um, FedEx is another big one, but shipping overnight with FedEx, big boxes is pretty expensive. So a lot of the cost of coral is strictly down to shipping, but there are markups, right? Cause you're going to have, I mean, the collection companies, they got to earn it up on these corals to keep the doors open. The wholesaler has to do the same deal. So they have to mark it up. And then of course the retailer again, has to mark the coral up. The retailer has to keep their doors open as well and earn a profit and pay their employees. And you know, a good retailer like all the LFSs we like to go to, they need to make some money. I mean, it's pretty expensive to have a small fish store. We all have a reef tanks that are watching this channel. You guys can all imagine what it costs to keep a reef tank, right? My big reef tank, I've got so much money in it at this point, I don't want to calculate it. But a store or a wholesaler or collection facilities, we're talking about huge amounts of water volume, lots of tanks. And as we all know, that's expensive. You have lighting, you've got salt water um, in stores and everything. We have to keep those changes going. So that stuff has to happen. So there's a lot of costs just built into the overhead of keeping the corals alive. Dry goods are a lot cheaper, right? You just throw them on the shelf. But we're talking about live animals with corals. So whether we're at the collection facility, the wholesaler, the retailer, all of those places have to have really good facilities to take care of these corals because nothing's less profitable than that dead coral. When you buy a coral, you ship it. If you fail at keeping that coral alive, you've just cost yourself a lot of money. So you, <clears throat> you have to account for all that. And unfortunately, losses are going to be part of it. I mean, when we're talking about shipping coral long distances, survival rates are actually better than what most people think. In fact, if I was to guess, I would say probably 95% or so for most large shipments. That's just a guesstimate based on my experience shipping coral over the years. But I would say 95 plus is very common for a lot of companies. So, but shipping loss will eat into your profits. I mean, if you order that really expensive coral and it dies, yes, there's a reimbursement for the coral from the seller sometimes, not always, but the shipping usually is not reimbursed. So this whole process is super expensive just from the business side. Shipping's a huge cost. Losses can be a huge cost. I think most companies have gotten losses under control to where they're not a huge deal, but they can be. I mean, if a shipment dies, which is not uncommon. Um, I heard a story about a, a local 
store that was ordering in some clams and they got put in the freezer section of the airline because they were marked as clams and they thought they were live food and they all died. I don't know how that worked out for them, but mistakes can happen and that kind of stuff can happen. So there's a lot of losses that come with that. So when you look at the price of coral, it actually when it actually is amazing that they're as cheap as they are because of this whole supply line that has to happen, that has to happen. When you can get a coral from Australia or Indonesia to go through that entire process and go pick it up in a store, and let's say a low-end colony could be as low as like $30. I mean, 30 bucks for something that was living in the ocean, harvested, put in a collection facility, shipped to LAX, then probably shipped again to a wholesaler, then probably bought and shipped again to somebody else so that it can end up in the store where you're buying it. For that colony to have an end price of like 30 bucks is pretty amazing. So that's kind of the base. That's like the amount of money that just has to happen because we have these built in costs, like the company's overhead, the cost of all the tanks and shipping is huge. Now we get into supply and demand because we all want the best in the coolest corals around. Unfortunately, there's very, very few of those out there. I mean, they're called rare corals for a reason. Now, when you're, when you're a collector, you can't just go out and find a honey hole full of gold torches and red acanthophilias and uh, rainbow chalices and all this kind of stuff. Those just don't exist. In fact, if you look at a natural reef, most of the coral that's out there, probably most of us as hobbyists, wouldn't really be too interested in. We'd go out and be like, well, that's brown. That one's brown. That one's brown. Yeah, actually, most of what's out there, most of us aren't going to be interested in. So we actually have to go out. So the collectors actually have to know where to go. And then they have to collect the corals that people want. And those corals we all want, like gold torches, are, well, rare. That orange and white acanthophilia I want so much is like a three to six hundred dollar coral because it's rare. Fortunately, Indo's back. So fingers crossed I can get one of those one of these days because trying to get one out of Australia was crazy. I mean, they were gettable, just not in my budget. But I mean, that's a huge part like supply and demand. I mean, high-end corals demand high-end prices because they're rare, they're hard to get, and they're expensive. But guess what? There are tons of cool coral out there that once upon a time were high end that are pretty darn cheap. It wasn't too long ago that something like a kryptonite candy cane, super green, while not like super high end, was like kind of a sought after piece. Like they just don't come in through wild collection that much. But as we started growing coral out, like this stuff's ubiquitous. You see them in frag shows now for like next to nothing. But it used to be something like that. It's like, oh yeah, that's real cool because everything came in as colonies, which brings us to the fragging and aquaculture side as to part of why things are so expensive. And most of what I talk about is from the American side. And it's gonna be a lot of the shipping stuff. I know countries like Australia are gonna be different, different laws. The good news is for you Aussies, you have like the world's best reef right off your coast. So you guys are a little lucky there, but I do feel you not being able to import a bunch of cool corals because they don't want that stuff ending up on your amazing reef that you have. But when we get to the aquaculture side, that's expensive too, because corals grow relatively slow, at least from a production standpoint. Um, for my real job, I work in a factory, right? I make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And they just fly through the lines, right? Like 400 a minute or whatever goes through there. 
crazy amounts. Well, nothing like that happens with coral, right? You get a coral, you want to aquaculture it, you cut it, you frag it, you glue it to the plug, and it grows out, or that colony grows out, you frag it. This is a really slow process. So to grow it, we have to have tanks, we have to have lights, we have to have employees to keep those tanks clean. There is a huge infrastructure that goes into an aquaculture facility. And of course, it seems like the really cool stuff is the stuff that grows really slow. So that adds to the price, right? Like the rainbow chalice that I want so bad, for some reason, isn't growing like an alien eye chalice, right? Alien eye and Hollywood stunner are everywhere. They grow so fast. But that's not what grows fast, right? I mean, Hollywood stunner, alien eye chalices everywhere in the hobby, super cheap because it grows fast. And of course, that's just not how it works with the high-end stuff, right? Gold torches are expensive. Now, the supply is probably much higher than a lot of us think, but the demand for gold torches is just crazy. Everybody wants one. So high-end corals command high-end prices because demand is super high, shipping costs are super high, and of course, they grow so slowly. So from an aquaculture standpoint, for the most part, we only aquaculture high-end stuff because that's the stuff that actually justifies the money for aquaculture, right? We're not going to grow out brown manipura. Nobody wants it. It has no value. We're going to grow out the nice stuff. It makes sense. So it's really expensive because demand is high and it's expensive to produce the lighting, the infrastructure. And then again, it is shipping. Most aquaculture facilities cannot be sustained by their local market. They have to ship out. And of course, shipping overnight is expensive. And in fact, one of the biggest costs when you purchase a coral, unless you're getting it out of somebody else's tanks like a buddy, is shipping we're kind of almost regardless as to whether it was from the ocean or an aquaculture facility shipping is a huge killer and of course the rareness now a lot of you guys are cheapskates like me i am the first to admit it and there are some crazy cheap corals out there and that's because they're the exact opposite of like a gold torch like xenia it grows fast in people's tanks they love to turn them in for store credit in stores. And usually you can pick up a Xenia frag really inexpensive. Same with like Zoas. Zoas, you can also buy in huge colonies, which can then be cut up into small frags. So, I mean, that's a lot of how you see like $5 frags at a frag swap. And frag swaps are another great place to go if you're interested in saving money. You got all these local people out there and they have their own tanks they'll pull out of, they'll buy coral, they'll import them in. Like these guys are usually hobbyists who are in it for the love of coral. And of course, fragging is another big thing that has brought the cost of coral down. Instead of buying a big colony, it can be cut up, healed up, and sold as lots of little ones, where by a price per square inch standpoint, you're paying more when you buy that little frag. But instead of one piece going out, we can send 10, 20, 30 out, something like that. So that helps a lot. The good news is supply should be going up with Indo backup. So Indo has always been the lower cost supplier of coral. The reefs are huge. The um, in the past, they've had less regulation on what could be shipped. Honestly, I'm glad to see the regulation coming back because guess what? I want sustainability. I want this hobby to be here in 30 years. I want to be doing this as an old man. So I want to be able to get those corals in. So let's at least have smart regulations so we're not raiding the reefs. Let's be smart about it. If we're smart about it, this can last indefinitely, which is what we all want. And I'm willing to pay a little more for that. And I'm good with that. Now, the big loss that we've had, and part of the reason things are so expensive these days, is 
Fiji. Fiji for a long time was like the best bang for your buck. The coral coming out of there was absolutely amazing. Their acros rivaled the stuff coming out of Australia, but they were much cheaper. Like a Fiji acro was like half the price of an Aussie acro. The LPS they had were absolutely amazing. And the prices were so reasonable. And the quality was so high. Fiji really was awesome. So in the last couple of years, we lost Fiji. We lost Indo. Vietnam was out for a while. So prices went crazy. The good news is we're starting to see a lot of price relief. So Indo's back on, somewhat limited. Right now, I think it's just cultured coral. I'm hopeful that that works out really well and that we struck a nice balance so that that helps with supply. The Aussies have done an awesome job keeping sustainability and supplies up, which is all super helpful. So I'm optimistic. And of course, aquaculture keeps coming online. And then us as hobbyists, we keep getting better at growing coral as well. We turn these corals in and people love it, right? I love to be able to turn coral in and get some store credit and get something else. And the stores love it too, because like the Xenia example I gave earlier, Xenia can be one of the easiest corals to grow, but it ships like crap. So it's fantastic that we can go in a store or a frag swap and get a cheap little Xenia frag. I mean, I've seen them as low as like five bucks for a Xenia. Fantastic pricing. But it's really cool that we can get a frag for like five bucks because it was almost free. It just grew in somebody's tank. They turned it in for store credit, got something else. It's really cool. So I'm super optimistic. <clears throat> I think as we go forwards, we're going to see prices stabilize and level out. I'm really pretty optimistic. But yeah, corals are expensive for two main, well, three main reasons, right? Companies have to make a profit. And for the most part, people aren't ripping you off. Short of a very few companies, most of the companies doing this aren't your super rich corporations. Most of them are relatively small and they're ran by people who do this almost as much because they love it as they're making money at it. I know a lot of people who sell coral. I don't know many people who sell coral who are also rich or at least that sell coral and didn't start off rich. There are quite a few of those. And then, of course, supply and demand. We all want a gold torch, but there aren't enough out there for everybody to have one at the price we'd all love to pay. So that's why they're so expensive. And then to contrast that, though, the reason we have really cheap coral out there is because as reefers, we've figured out how to frag it. We trade it amongst our friends. It really is a good process. So it's getting better. I'm optimistic if we could get the Fiji government to let Walt Smith and the other company down there start shipping out of Fiji, I think we would enter a new golden age for coral. Fingers crossed that this happens. Anyways, enough ranting about this. Let's get through some of the comments. All right, I'm going to scroll up. Got a lot here. We got good audio. Okay, where do I live? I live in Greeley, Colorado. So I'm about an hour north of Denver, kind of hence the name of the channel. Mile High Reefers, I wanted something memorable that people would know. Um, yes, import is expensive. That's a huge part of it. There are CITES fees, like every coral that goes out has a CITES fee on it. And it's even worse in the United States. Um, I'm going to let you... Oh, this is the dumbest thing, but it's true. Um, most of the world can get soft coral from Fiji, like those yellow Fiji leathers. We all want so much, a little more difficult coral, but we all want them. We, you can go get them in Canada, but you can't get them in the United States because of the way we do our CITES. So the soft coral itself doesn't have a CITES, but the rock it's on is what basically the government is considering the part of the coral that needs the CITES. So we don't get soft coral in the United States from what I've heard because of a little governmental issue about the rock on the coral. But yeah, Canada, 
you guys got them. I believe New Zealand's got them. Um, yeah, I think a lot of Europe has them. We just can't get them here because of that reason. It's real weird, and I would hope the government could fix that. But, oh, man, the government's a mess these days. We're not even going to go into politics. Holy crap. All right, let's see what else we got. This is great content here, just looking at messages. I'm sure you guys are loving it. Okay. We got a lot of Tang stuff and upgrading my 10 gallon to a 30 gallon. That's pretty awesome. I always feel compelled to buy $200 worth and get shipping at 50 bucks. So that's actually a really cool point about the shipping. Um, when you order corals online, usually there's gonna be a threshold where they give you free shipping, but somebody has to pay that shipping, right? Like it's a cost that has to happen. Even with negotiated rates with the biggest companies, like I'm gonna guess Live Aquarius is still pretty big. Um, I'm gonna bet they're spending a ton on shipping because it just costs a lot to overnight a package. So to get that Live Aquaria package from Wisconsin to Florida, it's expensive. That package has to be packaged at Live Aquaria or wherever. And then it needs to be sent to FedEx. FedEx has to put it on a plane and then from the plane, it has to go to the destination onto a truck through sorting facilities and all this. It's really expensive to ship a package. So from a buyer side, it's really smart to look for those kind of deals because really once you buy big enough volumes, they can put enough in a pack to kind of help with those shipping costs. But shipping costs are still huge. And even when you see like shipping for $39.99, I'd be willing to bet most companies are eating some of that cost because other than the smallest boxes, it's tough to overnight something for... 40 bucks, even dry goods. It's pretty hard to do that. So let's see, 420 reefer. I agree with some reg regulations are good. Yeah, so regulations are a big deal. And my understanding is part of the reason we had the problems with Indonesia is people were skirting the regulations. They were shipping stuff they shouldn't have. They shut it down and then pe people were still selling corals on the black market. So they were being smuggled out of Indonesia and sold. And I know this for a fact because I was offered these corals for sale and no, I wasn't touching them. I'm not, no, I cannot support a business like that because we need legal coral. We need it legally. So that was a big problem was there is some shady stuff going on. And yeah, we cannot as a hobby support any of that personally. Do not buy those corals because it's just bad for the entire hobby. Good news is, is I think a lot of that's been fixed these days. I kind of guess just because the way every industry works that people will do stuff they shouldn't. But yeah, the legal stuff isn't good. All right. $5 make you holla. Heck yeah, man. And $5 corals, frag shows. They're the place to go. There's almost always tanks out there with five dollar sections great place to go shout out from wisconsin how is wisconsin it sounds like it could be really cold but i haven't been watching the weather watching from homa louisiana ah louisiana it sounds so nice this time of year all right well we're about a half hour in so what did you guys think about the live stream i can't wait to see the video quality what it looks like um, yeah, so thank you for watching this episode of Mile High Reefers, and I'll see you on the next one.